Nigel Farage insisted today that he and UKIP are not racist. He's so keen to ram that point home, he's even spelt it out in a full-page advertisement in a newspaper. The accusations of racism followed his remarks that people would be concerned if a Romanian family moved in next door, but not Germans. I was asked a question, would people be concerned? And I think the answer is a lot of people would be concerned because they know there is the trafficking problem, they know there is the crime problem. Uh, but I in no way want to give the impression, as I might have done at the end of last week, uh, that, that, that a whole group of people that a whole group, uh, you know, should be labelled as being bad. I don't. I don't. I don't. Și dincolo e San Francisco, futui San Francisco, mami lui. Thank you for coming today. Today I want to uh, give a talk called uh, Boots, Godparents and Honest Idiots about the political stability of moral fragmentation in Armenian village where I did uh, two years of field work as part of my PhD right next door at UCL Anthropology. And uh, as anthropologists are wont to do, I will start with an ethnographic uh, vignette. So does one, one of the characters in the story, was taking a nap uh, when his mother woke him up, uh, she was quite uh, afraid that uh, he was again in trouble with the law and maybe he would end up behind bars again uh, because a couple of uh, SUV cars had just parked in front of their yard. However, it was nothing dangerous since from the cars uh, emerged poor people, three of them being uh, sheep owners in the area, one of them being Gheorghe, Gheorghe being a ritual brother to Razvan, meaning that Razvan had baptized um, Georgia's daughter. The other two shepherds were also connected by ritual kin. And the fourth guy was a local businessman who was, uh, was a candidate for the upcoming parliamentary elections. This uh, local businessman was a newcomer to politics and was now looking to recruit uh, local agents in a village well, to gather votes for him. So, Using his uh, contacts in the meatpacking industry, he reached a sheep owner and that sheep owner had another ritual kin that knew somebody else and somebody else, so on and so forth, and he got to Razvan. They uh, talked over the phone, uh, Razvan offered to help, he agreed, he promised to help him, and now the businessman came to Razvan's home to, to see him, to meet him, to see his, uh, his household, and to set up the um, following actions. So the man sat uh, around the table over coffee, nibbles, and they started discussing how they should prepare the elections. Gheorghe, uh, who was quite an um, imposing individual, vouched for Razvan's uh, trustworthiness. He said that he was very energetic and he, was, uh, uh, he knew a lot of people and he would definitely be a, a, a good uh, collaborator in this. But he also uh, showed to the businessman that, well, Look at him, he's young, he has two kids, and he also needs uh, a larger house. He also needs to, to make a name for himself in the village. And the businessman agreed and promised that uh, in one way or another he will reward uh, Razvan's uh, help. They shook hands and uh, they sealed this um, relationship. In a couple of days, Razvan came back to Seten, this village, uh, and his Audi, his large Audi car, was packed with black leather boots. He parked in front of the two taverns in a central village, uh, so the, the core, the central place in a village, uh, and he started putting on a show. Started calling on people, on relatives, friends, acquaintances, and he started distributing these boots. And these boots were received from the businessmen, and they were given as, well, we might call them electoral bribes, or as they say in Romania, pomano. Pomano meaning those alms that are given for the celebration of the dead, and it's a bit of a, of a joke that these are given as uh, apparent gifts, but in fact, they are used to, um, well, to persuade voters to uh, cast their vote for one candidate or the other. 
But as Van was uh, giving out these uh, boots uh, nominally to support his uh, political patron, but he also had his own plans. Since he gave uh, the boots to people who was trying to convince to vote for this businessman, but he also gave them to relatives and friends who were certain uh, that they will vote for this person, so there was no need to well, bribe them or to buy their vote. And he also gave uh, quite a lot of pairs to people who was quite certain that they would not vote for that uh, candidate since they had other arrangements. However, these people were close relatives and friends of his. So in a way, he was uh, already playing a bit of a double game. In the same time, supporting uh, the, his, uh, this uh, MP candidate, and on the other hand, preparing his own political career. So this was before the elections, and on election day, he was sitting in that tavern, and the results started coming in, and he was, started, he was counting the votes. Quite, uh, it was quite interesting that when he was counting votes, he was um, counting them as being his votes. They were not votes for the political candidate, but they were his votes. And when he started uh, putting down a few figures, uh, he became uh, a bit upset because he gave out more boots than votes actually came in. So he started uh, berating generic people without necessarily calling names, saying that, well, people are untrustworthy, look, they took the boots, but they cast their votes for somebody else. And, and he started um, commenting on the wretched state of uh, society, that you cannot really trust people, that they will uh, lie your face, they will promise something, and they will do something else entirely. Just to give you a little bit of uh, background about who Razvan was. But Razvan had a rather checkered history. He was uh, now in his mid-30s. Uh, he was quite an impress a physically impressive individual. He used to be a heavyweight uh, boxer in his youth. But he also did time in jail for rape. Although he came from a prestigious family and he was actually raised not in Saten but uh, in a city, during a summer vacation he got drunk with some uh, friends and they assaulted a local girl uh, in her household after um, a they were quite aggressive with her family as well. Nowadays, he blames this on the promiscuousness of the girl. And in fact, some uh, villagers um, do buy this, uh, this story. I mean, they did to put some sort of moral ambivalence on this, on this story. However, he did a couple of years uh, in prison. While he was uh, behind bars, he, um, he managed to um, to climb up the local hierarchies in jail. He landed uh, a very um, lucrative position in the prison kitchen, so having access to food was quite, was quite nice for him. Being uh, physically strong, uh, he became like the leader of his cell. And he also made quite a few connections with uh, hardened criminals doing time there. When he got out, he um, joined a network of um, mafia people working in Spain in uh, prostitution, uh, human trafficking, um, extortion, all sorts of racketeering and um, loan sharking. So he worked especially as an enforcer. He uh, became quite close with, uh, with the leader of that, of that group and he made quite a lot of money. However, he had uh, wasted most of them gambling. When he returned back to, uh, to the village, uh, he married, uh, had two kids, and he was always on the lookout for new business opportunities. He started uh, breeding sheep, and I had a video here, I have downloaded it from his uh, Facebook page. He's especially known for this bronze color, the sheep, which are quite unique in the area, and these are in a way his personal brand. And he also has four boys, which is very important for, uh, for a shepherd. Uh, shepherds uh, are, are quite proud of their masculinity and having boys is, uh, is an important part of their, of their personhood. Actually, they have quite interesting uh, ideas about what kind of a man or what he should do during sex to have boys rather than girls. So he started his, uh, this sheep business helped by his uh, family, his parents and some hired hands. Uh, he was also working with his father-in-law also in the cheese selling uh, business. But it was quite hard work. Um, he was making some money but uh, 
not enough for his expectations. He also started a more um, profitable business by working as a land intermediary for some mysterious companies who started buying land uh, around the area. Nobody knew exactly who they were and not even, uh, even he was selling the land onward to somebody else and uh, the final buyer was not really known. Uh, so he made quite nice money uh, with this and he was again playing a little bit of a double game since he kept the best plots for himself. Whenever he found a really, really good, uh, uh, good deal, uh, somebody who was selling very uh, cheap and the land was very good, instead of buying it for the clients, he was buying it uh, himself. And again, he was always on the lookout for what in Romania is called kombinazi. Combinations. Uh, what does it mean these kind of shady deals uh, that uh, only very proficient people know and have the courage to exploit? So for him, in a way, politics was just another one of these uh, deals. So after this, uh, these uh, elections, the MP got elected, even though he didn't get too many votes in Saten. And uh, Razvan started uh, preparing for his uh, next big step as an emerging local politician, which was running for mayor. In this endeavor, he was facing a quite uh, redoubtable adversary. Uh, I mean, the local mayor already had three consecutive mandates. But Azman was uh, faced with the same problem that every certain politician uh, faces, which is how to get the vote by gaining the trust of very untrusting People. So on a play on Napoleon Chanel's uh, uh, The Fierce People, uh, we might call Saten the Suspicious People. Now Saten is um, a fictive name of a village in northeast Romania, uh, known uh, as a region of Moldova, different from the Republic of Moldova, but culturally rather similar to some extent, uh, which is one of the poorest areas in Romania and of course in the EU. So I spent there two years of ethnographic uh, fieldwork and I had a mix of uh, serendipity and uh, luck allow me to enter into this uh, village society under quite auspicious conditions. I was not planning to do fieldwork there, I wanted to work with the Romanian migrants in Athens, but during my uh, pre-fieldwork um, forays in, in Athens, the economic crisis uh, began and most of the Romanians working in the construction wind industry were left out of a job and many of them returned to their home villages. So, following a few people that I met and befriended in Saten and also engaging in some, uh, some um, reciprocal help over there, including driving one of them from Athens all the way to Saten. We became friends and um, once I got to, uh, to Saten, I started working as an apprentice builder uh, in a construction team and I, had, I already had a few uh, established uh, contacts in the village. One of the things that um, people told me from the first moment I got to Saten is that I shouldn't trust other villagers. Uh, they told me that uh, people are wicked, they will take advantage of me, that I am naive, also because I have uh, certain resources that uh, I will be exploited. So they told me always to be hidden, to be secretive, and to be very careful with whom uh, I will trust. And of course, when I said that I shouldn't trust people, they didn't mean themselves. Uh, and they didn't mean uh, their families and the other people that I got to know through them. And from the first moments, as a classical anthropologist, uh, I was a bit sick of all the discussion about uh, kinship. I thought it was sort of old hat. However, when I got to sit in, I realized that almost all discussions, in one way or another, were revolving about uh, relatives. This was what, uh, what I saw as, uh, as, a, as an ethnographer, that the people I got to meet were mainly in this sphere of, first of all, families in the domestic domain, then uh, house visits to their relatives, and a few selected friends. And even, th even those friends uh, often had some sort of a ritual kin relationship uh, with other people. So by um, working as a construction worker, by attending home visits, rituals, and so on, I started to explore what might be called a very low trust uh, society. 
the result was uh, my, uh, my doctoral thesis, which then ended up as, as a book that has come out last year, I called Living with Distrust, Royalty and Cooperation in a Romanian Village, where I took this uh, theme of uh, ubiquitous and perennial distrust, and um, I wanted to see how it, how, it, um, how it sheds light upon various domains of life from the family and the household, kinship structures, religion and ritual, economics, and local politics. So my approach was uh, on the one hand uh, of a classical ethnography based on participant observation, discussions with people, collecting life histories, um, going to the well, rather scarce local archives. It also informed as uh, from, a, from a theoretical perspective, borrowing from cognitive and evolutionary uh, uh, approaches to social interaction. In a way, my view on morality is informed both by the cultural narratives that people tell about themselves and about others, and also about how uh, minds work in social interaction, uh, especially in domains as uh, communication and cooperation, which was quite relevant to my, uh, uh, to my theme of distrust. Uh, why distrust was uh, interesting for me is that uh, there's a lot of literature on low trust societies, on the negative effects that trust, uh, that a lack of trust in institutions and in generic people has on our on workings of societies and political systems. But anyway, my entire book was uh, an argument that distrust is a um, legitimate, it's, uh, it's a reasonable approach to social interaction given uh, the uh, conditions that people uh, are facing in the present and also of the ecological and historical uh, uh, patterns that, in a way, led to the contemporary state of Saten society. I would like to say that Saten is not really remarkable in any sense compared with the villages around it. And to some extent, the things I have observed there might be found in many other villages both in, in Romania, but also in neighboring uh, countries, post-socialist countries, but also in countries uh, surrounding the Mediterranean and others, uh, and others that have been described as um, low-trust societies. The main question I'm, I'm asking today, and I'm trying to offer an uh, answer, is given the fact that uh, Satani politics is uh, riddled with uh, corruption, neopatrimonialism, uh, various forms of uh, illegal or informal practices that seem to fly in the face of uh, what we would expect from a liberal uh, democracy. Why is the political system so stable? If we look back since the um, revolution in 1989, there has been no major conflict in the village. There has been no discourse of um, critique or trying to change something. In a way, mm, as the French say, plus ça change, plus c'est le même chose. There seems to be a very strong uh, pattern of social reproduction, of the same kind of uh, practices, which are quite incongruent, apparently, with what we would expect from a, a rule-based political system. And in a way, my answer will be, what explains this stability? In a nutshell, I will argue in a way, these patterns of uh, distrust that, uh, and, the, and, and distrust which is associated with a certain form of cooperation in this society explain uh, why there is no major disruption and there are no major divisions in this uh, society. And I would argue that to understand politics, we have to understand all the rest of uh, certain society, from uh, what households and families are, what the kinship system uh, is, how it functions, uh, systems of descent and marriage, all the way to cultural representations of uh, transcendence, what it's like to live a good life and what can people expect from a good life and especially what's the opposite. First I would like to go a little bit into the um, uh, history of the village. I will not go very much into it, just to give you a sense of the place. It's first documented somewhere in the 15th century and it has been a serf village. Uh, it belonged to monasteries and then to uh, boyars. So there was a, a boyar man manor there up until the 
18th century, where uh, serfs were freed, but they remained dependent upon uh, boyars uh, since uh, they didn't have uh, land. So they had to lease land from uh, boyars in quite unfavorable positions. The boyars were not the direct administrators of land. They had uh, people who were, uh, in a way, leasing the entire manor and then subleasing it peasants, since the boyars uh, were not even living uh, in the village, they were living either in big cities of uh, Bucharest or abroad. Uh, so they, they were absentee uh, landlords. And there were other people who were the actual administrators. In 1907, there was uh, a large peasant revolt that started quite close to Saten, in the same uh, region of uh, northern Moldova. It expanded to uh, entire country due to the very harsh conditions of uh, peasant livelihoods. Now in certain there was no bloodshed as there were in other places. Records show that uh, some peasants broke into the mail tea house and they burnt off the land registries which mentioned their debts to the, the boyars. So they were trying to uh, destroy the evidence that uh, they owned money and uh, they had to perform services uh, for, the, for, for those debts. This condition was described by uh, a socialist thinker in Romania, Dobrojan Ghera, as neo serfdom Although officially the peasants were free, they were no longer serfs, in uh, reality their dependency upon uh, land and, and upon uh, I mean the, the, the asymmetric uh, power relationships towards uh, boyars and, and their uh, intermediaries uh, made them serfs in all but name. Now, uh, things changed after the First World War when there was a large land reform. In order to cure the allegiance of uh, peasants as soldiers, the king and major politicians promised them land. And uh, so in 1920, there was a large land reform in which veterans and their uh, families, in case they died, received uh, three to five hectares of land, which was um, quite considerable for that time. However, their situation did not improve very much. First of all, because they did not have the technology, agriculture actually became less productive than before the reform. Also, the increase in demography in, uh, in that period of time meant that uh, this, uh, these properties became split among inheritors. In Romania, there was a partible inheritance system, so if, let's say, the father was a veteran and he had uh, five hectares of land, he had four children, then each received 1.25 hectares. So, through marriage and other kind of, uh, of arrangements, families ended up with diminishing plots and sometimes scattered all around the village, which uh, made work even more difficult. So the situation did not improve very much up until the 1950s, after the Second World War, when uh, the communist regime uh, implemented uh, a full-blown collectivization of uh, agriculture. So peasants were... Um, either well, persuaded but mostly forced to give their lands to a collective farm, which was nominally their own associations, they were members, they were owning uh, the institution, but in practice it was governed by, uh, by the state. They were only left with their households and very small subsistence plots. In the time, people from the factories and from the factories have constructed a new life, a new life, Spume gând de ură împotriva regimului de democrație populară, sabotează colectările, chiaporul Vasile Bourceanu din comuna Berezeni, regiunea Bârlad, n-a predat la colectare nici a treia parte din cotă. Țăranul muncitor din Berezeni îi cunosc bine ticăloșiile. Am de zile i-a șefuit cam codru, am de zile a sub laga satului această năpârcă nesătură, dar a sunat ceasul socotelilor. Din Pălciu, Bogdănești, Petrișoaia și din alte comuni, au venit la Berezen numeros săran muncitori să spună cuvântul la judecarea chiaborului sabotor. Nou an am slugărit, spune Ion Gugiu. Când i-am cerut plata, m-a dat pe mâna jandarmilor. Pe tractoristul Mihai Zală, chiaborul a amenințat cu moartea dacă va mai îndrăsti să are pământul întovărășiților. Țăranii muncitori nu vor uita niciodată chipul hidos al chiaborului Borceanu și faptele lui criminale. Ei și-au sporit hotărârea de a demasca pe toți dușmanii înrăiți ai poporului muncitor. Cu multă bucurie iau cunoștință de apariția proiectului de Constituție și colectiviștii din patria noastră. 
La Livedea are loc cu adunarea colectiviștilor care lucrează la Arghe. Întotdeauna noi am muncit pământul, spune țăranul Anton Tudor, dar niciodată n-a fost al nostru. Astăzi, iată că legea cea mare a țării înscrie acest drept al nostru. Tovarășul Tachion amintește cu multă emoție de marea cinste a colectiviștilor din Livedea de a fi avut în mijlocul lor pe unul din cei mai apropiați tovarăși de luptă ai marelui Stalin, Mareșalul Voroșilo. Colectiviștii din Livedea își exprimă dragostea și încrederea lor față de proiectul noii Constituții, sporindu-și eforturile în lupta pentru obținerea unei recolte bogate, pentru a da pâine din belșug poporului muncitor. În această luptă, colectiviștii primesc din plin sprijinul oamenilor de știință. Președintele Academiei Republicii Populare Române, profesorul Traian Săbulescu, experimentează noi soiuri de grâne care vor spori recoltele patriei noastre. Iată roadele unei științe avansate, sprijinită de statul nostru democrat popular. On the other hand, productivity increased quite a lot, given the uh, industrialization of uh, agriculture, improved technology and large-scale uh, large production. Uh, well, but the returns for uh, collective farm members were meager. So, uh, in Satin, as almost everywhere in Romania, everyone resorted to theft and pilferage. From uh, kids to very old people, everybody was stealing from the collective farm. Uh, as the saying went, the one who doesn't steal from the farm steals from his children's mouth. And indeed, to survive, they needed to, to steal crops, animals, materials, anything that they could get their hands on. But this also fueled a shadow economy in which people were raising animals or trying to do petty commerce uh, as much as possible hidden from the law. And some people were uh, those who were more adventurous, more courageous, they had uh, good ties with officials, with policemen and so on, sometimes became quite rich from this uh, second economy. However, since most of these activities were illegal, there were many cases of people informing on fellow villagers mostly anonymous uh, denouncements. So farm officials and police would come, they would uh, confiscate property, and uh, some people even ended up in jail. And this contributed to a state of generalized suspicion between, uh, between villagers. They did not know who was a friend, uh, who was a foe, who, uh, if uh, a neighbor could see that uh, you're hitting a couple of pigs and he could uh, tell on you, uh, to the police, and uh, your whole uh, work will be ruined and you could even end up with, uh, with a jail sentence. So this added to the various forms of social division between uh, villagers that uh, were pre-existent before communism, but probably the communist period increased even more the um, generalized reciprocal suspicion between villagers. Uh, which sometimes may be said to be bordering on paranoia. In uh, 1989, the um, communist regime fell, and this, in certain spelled the end of the collective farm. Nobody wanted to keep the collective farm, so they uh, returned the lands according to original property uh, rights in a very dysfunctional uh, process. Given the fact that uh, quite a lot of time uh, had uh, passed, people had to prove with uh, documents who owned what, what were the property borders between uh, different plots. There were also, since there were a few decades, some people had died and, uh, and there was a problem between um, inheritors. The whole process was highly dysfunctional all across Romania and this uh, created a lot of conflicts, especially between uh, family members and neighbors. So people who somehow had land either had uh, neighboring land or they had to split up family land. This led to um, quite a lot of legal cases, but also to uh, physical violence. There were quite a lot of people who uh, killed even their own brothers fighting over land. Now, what happened to the farm? This is a very nice painting that I found. It's not about Seten, it's about another village, but something similar happened all across uh, Romania. Uh, meaning that uh, all the assets of the farm, the machinery, the buildings, uh, the animals, were divided between farm members. In some places it was more organized, in others it was a free-for-all, as we can see in this image. A fascinating uh, story 
and I begin the book with this, is that a team of uh, about a dozen uh, Sateni uh, farm members have received a building, uh, a, a newly built stable, as uh, uh, because they had certain rights, they had some work days, and because the farm didn't have anything else to give them, they were offered a building uh, as co-owners. And on the day they were, that they were handed over, they all came with their horse-drawn carts and with tools, and basically they uh, demolished the building and they carted home whatever materials they could uh, scavenge from there. So like wooden beams, um, cement blocks, uh, even like even pieces of, of concrete. Uh, they all took them, I mean, and, and they, uh, they used chalk to uh, mark slices, so equal slices of the building, and everybody took home whatever was in their slice uh, that was allotted to them. No one had ever suggested uh, that they could keep the building together to, to use it or to sell it or uh, nothing. For everyone it was the intuitive decision that they could not hold property in common with unrelated villagers because these villagers were just random farm members. They were not relatives, they were not families, just a random selection of any villagers that had no pre-existent trust between them. So the only solution they could see was to destroy a perfectly functional building so as at least to get something out of it. So they took everything home and uh, actually there were two buildings that were demolished exactly like this. So this tells you a little bit how Satanis see the scope of cooperation between people. They would not trust another villager, a random villager, with uh, co-owning something. They would rather go for the short-term decision of at least getting something, fearing that uh, they might, might end up with nothing, that they would be cheated out of it. What is the situation uh, today? Satan remains a uh, relatively poor village, although for local standards uh, it's pretty well off, meaning that people have uh, a bit more land uh, on average than in other villages. Its infrastructure is really poor, so at the time of my field work, there was electricity, and that was from the communist period. But apart from the main road and a few segments, there are mostly dirt roads. There is no running water, no um, sewage system. There is no gas. It's quite uh, far from uh, the main roads. It's really uh, in, a, in a corner of, of, the, of Romania. And still, the main occupation is agriculture. The land is quite fertile, uh, it's in these hilly plains of, of Moldova, it's quite good for cereals, it has quite a bit of pasture for sheep and cows, but there is no industry, there is a very low employment rate, and the main employer is actually the state. So with a, with a melody and uh, other jobs, uh, so that's the most people who, who have a job work for the state. Quite a lot of uh, people are, uh, so their livelihoods depends on uh, state payments, either in forms of pensions or welfare payments. And now EU subsidies have added to, the, to, their, to their income. This was quite a big uh, boost in the recent years. One of the most important phenomena is, as in other parts of Romania, large-scale migration towards Western Europe. Uh, looking for jobs, even though people in Moldova were not among the first uh, to go. So they were in what may be called the third wave. They were not the first ones, uh, ones to leave. And in agriculture, uh, most people engage in subsistence agriculture. So they work their little plots with quite rudimentary implements, including like horse-drawn plows. But a few emergent entrepreneurs have started to create what might be called more professional farming uh, units using various means including uh, the tools that they managed to appropriate from, from the collective farm and especially, uh, and that's quite, quite especially in the area, there are quite a number of uh, sheep owners who are growing uh, in, in size due to their very assertive demeanor. All of them are men, and they're quite physically dominant uh, men. By stealth uh, or by force, they um, took over the lands of uh, poorer uh, peasants, either 
uh, buying them or leasing them in very advantageous terms. Uh, they're quite um, aggressive, grazing their sheep illegally on, on other people's crops, and nobody really dares to, to challenge them. Since they are, as I said, quite uh, aggressive, and uh, quite a few of them have maimed or even killed other people and they got off with it because they are also very well connected uh, with the police, with prosecutors. Quite a lot of them had did time in jail and this is quite important and I'll come back to it. They are folk experts in the law. They really know how to uh, beat up somebody or even to kill someone and get away with it. And I was quite impressed of how well they knew how to do it without uh, legal Repercussion. And Razvan was one of these emerging figures. Let's now take a look at Razvan's main adversary that I will call Matei. Matei also came from a, from a family of a very good reputation. And interestingly, he had a job that uh, quite a lot of mayors in that area, as I discovered, used to have, which is the job of a postman. And I, didn't realize why postmen were quite uh, successful in politics, until I realized that they're one of the few people who got to know almost all villagers because especially they hand out pensions and other uh, welfare payments. So they travel around the village all the time and they're one of the few people who actually come with good news, money. So they enter people's houses, then out uh, people know them, and Matei at that time, he was quite uh, friendly and always had a good word with, with everyone, so people uh, liked him. So using this uh, social capital, Matei became a mayor when he was quite young, I think he wasn't even uh, 30 at the time. However, he was quite uh, naive, uh, he lacked experience, so his first mandate was uh, not really uh, successful. It was also during a time when um, uh, Romania was not doing very well economically, so he lost uh, the next elections and returned to his uh, job as postman. Now his replacement was uh, an old uh, collective farm cutter, also known uh, by people, from uh, especially by, by the elders, and he was um, quite uh, steeped in the uh, old ways, so much so that when he received a very large sum of money from, uh, from the local county, from the local administration, he was afraid of spending it because he thought that uh, there definitely is going to be some sort of irregularity and the anti-corruption officials will come after him and he will end up in jail or worse. So basically he sent the money back. He was honest. He didn't want to do any kind of shenanigans, but he also didn't want to take any kind of risk with this, uh, with these funds. Nowadays, people remember him as an honest idiot. So they admit the fact that he was honest, but they also call him an idiot because, uh, well, he didn't make any kind of uh, gains from this, but neither did the village. When Matei got elected for a second time, he was not going to follow on the footsteps of his predecessor, but he was rather uh, becoming what quite a lot of people call a smart thief. Now, it's interesting that, this, that there's a symbolical association that a lot of people uh, uh, make between being smart and being a thief. And when I've asked people, what do you say that thieves are uh, smart? I said, well, a thief cannot help being smart because if he is dumb, he's going to get caught. So for them, as for example, in uh, Michael Hersfeld in Greece also discussed about Klefturia, there is this image of the man, and it's usually a man, who is uh, cunning, smart, always on the lookout for opportunities to enrich himself against the law, but that's basically what entrepreneurs usually do. They find different spheres and that they can broker between them to make a profit. And breaking the law is one such uh, element. And on the other hand, being honest is uh, often associated with being naive, with uh, lacking uh, courage, knowledge or experience to make this kind of, uh, of a deal. So Mate was this image of a daring politician, using this Americanism, he was hustling, he was really a hustler. When he got to his uh, second mandate, he was also fortunate to be in power during years in which Romania was undergoing a small economic boom, so about 2004, 2005, and also his party was in power. So this meant that quite a lot of funds were coming into Saten since a lot of the um, financing of 
local government, comes from the county office and further up from the national government. And uh, mayors who belong to the party in power are more or less uh, transparently receiving, uh, they receive more funds than other mayors. So when he got uh, in a job, he really starting doing serious business. Now, let me mention a few of the ways in which he was, uh, might be called, a smart thief. At some point, there was a law for uh, young, uh, that young people could receive plots of land from the local administration for free. So what Matei did, he took a few young men that he knew he could trust because they were dependent upon him. Uh, these were usually quite uh, poor and vulnerable villagers and um, he made them uh, sign up for this uh, land plots and he, as a mayor, signed on, on these papers and afterwards uh, they sold him the land as a private person. So he now had uh, a huge hacienda at the end of the village and everything was perfectly legal. Nobody, uh, I mean, on paper, he did nothing uh, wrong and he knew he could trust those people that they will sell him back the land because uh, he had control over them in various ways. On that hacienda, he uh, planted an orchard, uh, he uh, built a few uh, professional buildings, he started uh, building um, various prefabricated concrete blocks that he sold to other mayoralties in the areas for their own local government uh, projects. And he also started building a little professional farm with like uh, tractors and uh, harvesters and so on. He also had a, uh, next to the orchard a very nice little uh, relaxation space uh, for like barbecue and a little uh, veranda. And there he would entertain relatives, friends and so on. So he was living quite a good life. So who's working on this agenda? He had quite a lot of uh, people coming in and working there for free because these were uh, recipients of uh, welfare payments. And according to the law, if you're really poor, you get a minimum guaranteed income and uh, the recipients have to work a number of, that have a mandatory number of hours that they have to perform for public services. And the conditions to getting this uh, revenue are um, fuzzy enough uh, to allow a lot of bureaucratic discretion for the mayor, uh, for the people under the mayor, who, who decide who gets the money and who doesn't. So these recipients, he called them, and instead of working for the village, they were working on his, uh, well, I call it a manor, as manual labors. He didn't pay them, but he did give them uh, drinks and sometimes uh, cigarettes and stuff like this. So he was also being a bit generous. Now, for these people, it was um, actually better than to work in public services rather than uh, cleaning gutters or doing other kinds of works. Since they were uh, becoming uh, uh, ingratiated with the mayor, it was nice work working on that, on that manner. They had to work anyway. And nobody really complained about this diversion of uh, workforce since also there were very little common public projects in Saten to, to start with so there wasn't much uh, much need for them and moreover as I will discuss the villagers don't really conceive of, of a common good that somehow belongs to the entire village or to all the villagers uh, uh, as a group as a whole. What else was uh, was he doing? So how, how did uh, Matei got power? So one of the things he did even during that gap in his mandate, uh, he became a godparent to many children of uh, Sateni villagers. So he, he baptized them. Usually he baptized uh, some key allies. So people who were more pr prominent in the village, people who had um, many relatives, they came from respected families. So he created many ties of ritual kin in the village. And this was actually a strategy that um, most people engaged in politics in one way or another uh, in Saten uh, do. Uh, so they become uh, godparents, which is a quite uh, interesting uh, relationship between the fictive ritual parent and the actual genealogical parents. So they become somehow ritual siblings, ritual brothers. So his two strategies were to create a core of uh, dependent villagers among the poor and the vulnerable and a core of allies that he uh, got on his side and 
the, this relationship was institutionalized and communicated to the entire village through these ties of uh, fictive kinship. We did a lot of uh, really shady deals. I saw a bridge, which was actually literally a few wooden planks being thrown over a river, and it cost I don't know, a few tens of thousands of uh, euros. He bought a truck and an excavator for huge amounts from really shady companies, companies that were connected with his own party. He offered um, advantageous deals to some uh, rich ship owners that uh, needed uh, land. And what's fascinating is that everybody pretty much knew about this. So there was no secret about all his, uh, all his deals. Actually, he sort of made them out in the open. Moreover, one time when uh, Razvan, his uh, opponent, rattled him in a tavern and Ma Matei, the mayor, was a bit drunk, he started calling himself Jupun. Jupun is a quite an archaic term associated with the boyars. So he was really telling him that, uh, in a way, he owns the village, that he's uh, the uh, master of, of the village and uh, nobody can uh, dethrone them. So he was asserting his personal dominance over the politics and the local governance of Saten. That moment and in other moments as well, Razvan, the young uh, contender, replied that Matei's power was not that certain, since he was depending on doggies, as he called them. And by doggies, he meant people who were in this kind of patron-client relationship with Matei. And just like uh, doggies, they were associated with him out of fear, not out of love. And just like dogs, they could uh, abandon him for a meteor bone. And Razvan was actually trying to do exactly this, which was to create his own faction, a rival to Matei's faction, and to get to power. But it was not the doggies, or the really wretched uh, people, who uh, started having thoughts of shifting sides. It was actually those people who were rather close to Matei and actually started to understand and uh, actually get financial information about how much money was coming to the village and how much was it was siphoned by uh, Matei and some uh, key leaders in his uh, faction. And they considered that their share was not large enough and they started thinking of alternatives. And that's pretty much what Razvan was offering them. Because he started to create his own faction, which was, in fact, a mirror image of Matei's. He also started baptizing uh, children uh, in order to make allies with their parents. He also started acting as this kind of uh, generous but also dominant uh, leader uh, using his physical prowess but also these kind of acts uh, of kindness such as giving boots to poor people or rounds of drinks in the tavern and uh, so on. But in deed and in discourse, he was not offering a different deal than uh, Matei was offering. And that's quite important, and that's the next subject I want to discuss, which is why do all politicians seem to offer a similar kind of uh, political offer based on cronism, corruption, and um, uh, neo-patrimonial management of uh, village commons. I'm going to take a step back and discuss a little bit about the, the moral outlook of Sateni villagers in general. So as I said, from the first moment, I was told two things. Uh, not to trust people. At the same time, I was presented to a lot of, uh, of people connected by kinship and friendship. and um, warmly received and I made more and more contacts and friends among them. But here's a paradox. A lot of moral discourses revolve around kinship. So people say uh, one treats relatives better and in turn one is treated better by relatives. So people make this distinction between uh, relatives and what they call strangers. And basically a stranger is someone who is not a relative. So the moral world is divided into two kinds of people. The ones with whom there is a preferential moral attitude, there is expectation of uh, generosity, of solidarity, and the other part where not only these expectations uh, are not warranted, but even worse, outside there is a, a perilous world where people can be 
dangerous, they can, they can deceive one, and uh, one has always to be guarded and to defend their interest against them. John Campbell did a wonderful ethnography of the Salakatsani in the 50s in Greece. Uh, he sort of said this, and this is exactly what I saw and I sensed, especially in Saten. The sense of being under constant siege. So people have a sense that uh, they have uh, a nucleus um, uh, around their household, around their family. Uh, they have a few trustworthy relatives, but outside they are under siege from various perilous forces. However, the greatest danger comes not from strangers, but from relatives. It was the, the second day in, in the village when I heard someone saying that not even the devil fucks you like relatives do. So, this was disconcerting since I thought that, well, weren't the relatives the, the uh, moral uh, actors between themselves? But then I realized that relatives are dangerous exactly because one lowers his guard. Since you are secretive and uh, you have always this kind of defensive uh, posture against strangers, it's actually the relatives that are closer to you, that know a lot about you, and it's with relatives that you engage in this kind of cooperative engagements that also create the opportunity of default, of cheating, of, uh, of deceiving, and hence the relatives, the people who are close to you, have the means of doing more harm than other people. In Romanian, and especially in this area, there is a word, neamur, which is a collective uh, kin term which includes all possible relatives. This includes uh, people connected by uh, descent, which is cognatic, meaning on both sides, both through males and females. People connected through ties of affinity, and marriage is exogamous, so one um, cannot marry people who are closer than third cousins. But they also include uh, what anthropologists call fictive kin, through adoption or uh, ritual. Ritual kin is, appears at uh, marriage and at uh, baptism. So there are wedding sponsors, which are in a way the spiritual parents of uh, a newlywed couple. And uh, you have uh, godparents, which are sp the spiritual parents of, uh, of a baptized uh, child. The same word is used for both of them, Nash. And there's also uh, the relationship between the godparents and the genealogical parents uh, is that of uh, kumetria. Uh, and kumetria is a fascinating uh, word. It means uh, that uh, social relationship between people that might be described as ritual siblings, ritual brothers, ritual sisters. It also means the party that, uh, that is organized after the baptism, so that uh, celebration. But it's also used, uh, so the term also extends to this kind of preferential deals that people have with uh, one another. Sometimes I uh, heard someone saying that, oh, I'm going to harvest some uh, hay from uh, a plot. He said, well, that's not your land. Yeah, but I have a kumetria there. And by kumetria, he meant he had, uh, he had a deal with someone, who was someone who was a friend, and he was using this word to describe that kind of um, long-term relationship of cooperation and trust between people. So this, this event was part of that relationship. So in Saten, there is this paradox that, as Maier Forte said, you should be able to trust kin and trust relatives, but at the same time, the worst kind of moral transgressions come from uh, relatives. And the, there is a cultural way in which Sateni deal with this paradox. Because there is a difference between being kin with someone and what they say, holding on to kin. To be kin is to have some sort of a genealogical relationship through descent, marriage, adoption, ritual, and so on. Holding on to kin means something else. Holding on to kin means um, explicit and um, ostensive recognition, taking that formal kin relationship and developing it. Developing it through things like um, calling each other by a kin term, by um, visits, kind of symbolical gestures, and especially by engaging in um, mutualistic cooperation with relatives. So people could say that two people are kin, but they don't hold each other as kin. As I uh, discussed in a chapter on ritual, perhaps the quintessential moment of holding or not holding on to kin is death.
or the death of a person, that's where you see the moral universe of that person and of uh, their family. And if people don't come to the wake and to the funeral, this means that no matter what's the kin relationship between them, they are not relatives in practice. They stop holding on each other as kin. And actually, people even say that uh, of two families that they have become estranged, that uh, they don't even go to each other's funerals, even if it happens or not. But that's the way you say that uh, two families, which might be as close as two brothers, for example, they stop holding on each other as kin. And they stop referring, uh, mentioning to other people that they are kin and so on. This is a sort of a um, process of erasing these ties, of ignoring them. And in a generation or two, you have uh, genealogical amnesia. People will stop remembering that they're close relatives of others. And on the other hand, quite distant kin ties, like second or third cousins, may be emphasized and increased in intensity, especially if people have some sort of shared common interests, whether in terms of uh, cooperation in I don't know, agriculture, domestic work, and other kind of uh, endeavors. So, this element is quite important because there, there is an um, you know, objective structure of geological relationships, but what matters is this uh, process of uh, making, holding on, and uh, erasing kinship. And for this dynamic process, it has, on one hand, it has idiosyncratic patterns. Sometimes some people just don't get along, sometimes uh, there's a quarrel which uh, becomes uh, chronic and it leads to uh, permanent separation. But we can observe certain structural patterns. Perhaps the most obvious one is created by partible inheritance. Since partible inheritance turns siblings into potential competitors, since all of them are fighting to get as much as possible from the parental uh, patrimony. In theory, they all should get an equal part with an extra share for that uh, sibling which stays at home and takes care of the old parents and buries them and so on. But in practice, many things can go wrong. Some siblings uh, are better negotiators than others and uh, they get a larger share. It's quite difficult to split up land since it varies in quality, in position. Somebody might feel, uh, might feel disadvantaged uh, from, from a certain division. The um, husbands and the wives might also uh, put, uh, put pressure on, uh, on a sibling and they add another level of potential conflict. And, of course, it can go exactly the other way around. Siblings might stay on friendly terms and they can cooperate with one another. I mean, the best example is to look at two siblings, brothers, who have uh, neighboring plots of land. On one hand, the things could go mostly in like two directions. They can cooperate with one another. For example, they can plow together. They can uh, help each other with harvest because close to one another. On the other hand, they might squabble over the border. And sometimes that happens because it's fascinating how much passion people put even in half a meter of land that they felt that the other one has slowly encroached. And those encroachments do happen. Moreover, since a lot of uh, siblings not only uh, stay as neighbors for the agricultural land, sometimes they even remain as neighbors in the domestic domain, because there is usually like a, uh, a large family plot that gets uh, segmented into smaller plots, and they re also remain as uh, neighbors. But there's also a definite rule that it's impossible to have two siblings sharing a household. People laughed when I said this. They said, oh, no, it's, it's impossible. One family, one household. What you can have is one or two more generations, so vertical kinship, but never lateral kinship. And this um, uh, siblinghood, cum neighborhood, it can facilitate cooperation. But if you think about it, if there's a conflict over land and so on, it's not only the fact that you felt disadvantaged, that there was an unfair division of uh, parental property, support, love, and so on. But if there's a separation, you can't get away. So each day you wake up and you're next to your uh, brother who is your enemy. And this increases the sense of frustration. So two brothers, oh, this was extreme case, but these two brothers, they each erected a four meter wall 
towards the, the other person, uh, the other brother's yard. Punishment, but it was also symbolic. One was enough, but now each of them built his own wall. And indeed, when one of the brothers died, uh, the other one did not come to the ritual and so on. And people were saying, well, it's as if they were never brothers. And, and their descendants also split off. We can see in this case how there is kinship, but uh, they did not hold on each other as kin. So the moral universe uh, of, of Satanis looks like this. In the center, you have the only corporate group, which is the family. So outside the family, there is no corporate group, no uh, group with a certain sort of identity or social relationships of uh, solidarity. And moreover, it's not only the family, but it's the family household uh, nexus. So in a way, the household makes the family. The family usually includes a couple, their children, if there are any, parents, if uh, the parents of one or the other spouse, if they're still alive, sometimes even grandparents. They might include close or more distant relatives that don't have, are not married, and they come to live with uh, their relatives. So in a way, they're adopted. Sometimes there's like true adoption, old couples without kids, or if they have kids, they have uh, moved elsewhere to like Bucharest or other places. There's this phenomenon of late life adoption in which they take a young, couple usually. They prefer relatives if, if possible and if not they look for someone who has like, a good reputation who are usually poor, they don't have their own land and property. So they take them in as uh, offspring and they uh, establish this mutualistic relationship in which they, uh, the young people take care of the old ones and most importantly they uh, bury them and they perform all the rituals and they uh, inherit a house uh, and land and everything that exists there. It's a replication of what should have been biological kinship when life doesn't offer this opportunity. And the family is the only corporate unit where all the interests are aligned. And usually you don't speak of individual properties, it's, it's usually the family who owns everything. No matter what, what is in the paper, the land, the house, the animals, everything belongs to this very small corporate group. And most importantly, the family is the only place of default trust. You can feel that the attitude of people changes. So when they are in their house, in their households versus when they are outside, they are quite a lot more relaxed. They can finally sort of breathe and they can be expansive. It's as if they are in that sort of, uh, they are on solid ground with their families. One thing I should mention, the domestic domain shows quite a lot this separation. The household looks a little bit like a symbolic also practical fortress. You can't really see what goes on inside of it. There are places uh, that are uh, shown towards the outside, towards the road, towards neighbors, and there are places which are hidden that only the family knows. There is a strong emphasis on fences. If you're like a good householder, you have to have strong fences. The household might extend in the outside with various ties of uh, kinship, good relations with neighbors and uh, friends um, of a mutualistic condition. Foster argued that a lot of peasants have a limited good approach to life. They see that all the good things in life are limited, so if somebody has more, someone must have less. He says that it's like a cultural representation that informs the beliefs and the actions of people. But now if you look at Saten, we can see that the limited good approach is not merely a cultural representation, it's actually an objective description of the various zero-sum games that people are engaged in. Property over land is a zero-sum game. Land is limited and uh, the only way to get more land is if somebody gets less land. And uh, for the sibling division of property, it's exactly a zero-sum game between siblings and between other relatives that get engaged. In. Many other uh, interactions have this zero-sum uh, game approach to it. So this is why people feel that uh, they are in competition with the others uh, and indeed they are. But of course, that's not all there is to it. Uh, there are many other interactions which are plus some games, which you have mutualistic support. It used to be the case a long time ago of like building houses or uh, making hay, which uh, needed a large group of people. And you had a system in which uh, I come to help you build your house, I come to help you uh, with the hay, and you'll offer me the same kind of support sometime in the future. So you have this kind of mutualistic cycle between people. But of course, 
it's not with everyone. It's only with that uh, set of relationships that uh, people have um, uh, recognized and most importantly, they uh, manage them, they reproduce them. So it's a continuous cycle of reciprocal help. And if it's not in practical terms, then it's in symbolical terms, such as visits, acknowledging others. People are not called brothers by their kin terms, but the further one goes in geological terms, the more uh, you use the kin term and not the name. That's why uh, you'd hear people call each other cousin, uh, ritual brother. That's when you really want to emphasize the kin relationship. Again, contrasting with what Banfield discussed about the Southern Italian uh, community called a moral familism that one should uh, only work for the interests of his own family and assume that everybody else does the same. Well, that is true for Saten as well as probably for many other village societies. But this does not mean that people cannot engage for their the interest of their own family, so it's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a private interest, but they engage in mutualistic interactions with other families in which both parties have something to gain and they can do something that uh, they would not be able to do on their own. So people are not irrationally selfish or they cannot think about or represent forms of uh, cooperation with others. The problem is that not many opportunities for cooperation exist. There are more zero-sum games than plus-zero-sum games being offered by the objective conditions of economic and political lives. Although villagers are different in many ways in terms of status, uh, prestige, uh, reputation, uh, and so on, fundamentally, they don't recognize any large differences between themselves. So all of them obey pretty much the same moral code, all of them see the world in a certain way and know that the others see the world in that similar way. Well, of course, if we talk about this image of familism, care for their family above other interests and know that all the others are just like them. So in this case, similarity and homogeneity breeds opposition whenever the interests of families become opposed. And that's not because the other is essentially different, but exactly because the other is quintessentially similar to oneself. Returning now, I guess it's exactly this is what we see in certain politics, where we have these two actors, where we have Matei, the mayor in power, and Razvan, who was contesting the elections. That is one lost the elections. He didn't manage to get enough votes, but he did give a run for his money to Matei, who was a bit, uh, he, he was a bit afraid that he might uh, lose elections. This is one managed to gather a bit of opposition among the mayor's allies uh, defected thinking that will get uh, a larger size of the pie if Razvan uh, won. There was also treachery on the other side because some of uh, Razvan's allies were also convinced by Matei to join his side. So in the end, what we have was Matei being elected for a fourth mandate. Razvan got a position as local councillor and his faction also got a few seats there. Why did Matei win and why did uh, Razvan uh, lose? On the one hand, Matei really held the fork and, and the knife, as the villagers say. He had access to money, to um, the kind of jobs and contracts that uh, a mayor can assign, and his hold on power was still, was still quite, quite strong. Not enough uh, allies uh, defected to jeopardize his position. But there was actually more. The fact that Razvan did not manage to get people to trust him. No one thought that he was different to Matei. The problem was that he was similar to him, but, as an old lady told me, they are all thieves, but at least these who are in power, and she actually described them in physical terms, and she was quite right, they are fat and pink, like pigs, but at least uh, these ones are full. The ones coming next will come hungry, so they will steal even more. And she was referring to, uh, to Razvan. And one cannot say that she was not right. A few months after the election, Razvan did manage to score a political win over uh, Matei. New law forced the local administration to give out a village pasture, to lease it to private companies. So there was an um, auction, and um, Razvan, using some of his um, connections uh, with uh, regional uh, politicians, he organized association with uh, several shepherds and uh, other animal owners and they won the auction against uh, Matei's uh, faction. 
even these kind of reforms that try to take away resources from local administration and uh, send them uh, towards private contractors, thinking that this will be more accountable and so on, doesn't you know, do uh, the job. The night watchman of the village, a law said that they cannot be hired by the mayoralty. The mayoralty has to hire a private company to do this. So a private company did come, they did win the, the, the contract, but the mayor told them that, okay, now you need to hire a watchman. This is a list of people that you're going to hire. Uh, and all of these were members of his party. And the private contractor had no reason to make enemies with the mayor, so he hired those night watchmen, and it was a mutualistic, um, uh, mutualistic uh, corporation. In this case, uh, the company got its money, and uh, Matei used those jobs as means of securing the allegiance of his uh, party members that landed quite nice jobs with benefits and so on. And of course, on paper, everything was fine. The only thing was that all those people who were hired as night watchmen belonged to the political faction of the mayor. Now, in this case, uh, the other political faction uh, got hold of this resource, the common pastures. So what they did, they created this association. Uh, on paper, they were all farmers promising to manage the commons together and so on. But in fact, uh, the only thing that happened is that Razvan and a couple of people, they cashed in the EU subsidies. They did a few, just for show, a few, uh, they spread a bit of fertilizer. They gave a few, a few sacks of fertilizer to uh, association members and they kept most of the money to themselves. I mean, and they were quite skilled in doing this. Nobody complained because if people were really afraid that they would lose uh, grazing access. So the fact that they they still had access to pasture was enough for them and they saw that one is doing exactly what Mati was doing which is gatekeeping resources that came from the outside and as a smart thief as a shrewd political operator both of them kept the lion's share for themselves the story of this uh, agricultural association was the mirror image of uh, what happened in the local governance of the mayor. After this, Razvan got a bit of money out of his political endeavor. So we have these two political actors who are engaged in vicious fights. There was also threats of uh, violence. They almost got into a, into a physical scuffle, but they were quite similar in uh, their moral outlook and what they were promising the villagers. And moreover, as, in, uh, as it happens in certain kinship and in friendship, today's enemies become tomorrow's friends. Since um, people observed that Razvan was not really active uh, in the following elections, they say he was actually doing uh, the mayor's uh, place. All the rumors come to an end when they saw them having a barbecue and turbo folk manele music uh, and uh, drinking uh, long into the night in Matei's hacienda, uh, thus sealing a uh, new alliance between these two local big men. And since then, Razvan became the right-hand man of Matei, uh, despite the fact that uh, they were calling each other names and uh, almost got into a fight. And people were not really surprised about this, since this follows a long series of friends turn to enemies, or relatives turn to enemies, and the other way around, enemies turned into friends, and sometimes enemies turned into relatives. And I would not be surprised if at some point in the future there might even be some sort of ritual kinship between these two men. Even though people might uh, call them thieves and so on, at the same time, when they look at someone like uh, Matei, like the mayor, they say about him that he's a good gospodar. Now, a gospodar means a householder. And a householder means someone who is really looking after the interests of his family, who is acquisitive, who has a lot of like, animals, a lot of land, a lot of uh, buildings. When Matei is the mayor, running local governance as if it is his own household, even though nominally it's, it belongs to the entire village, people do see him as a good householder because he does exactly what everyone else is doing. He's protecting his interests, he's trying to get as much as possible for uh, himself, and of course not uh, spending uh, the wealth, uh, his patrimony, drinks and so on, but being engaged in these kind of mutualistic relationships with friends and relatives, exactly what he's doing, only 
also in uh, his uh, private uh, capacity as a Tetany villager, but also as a mayor. And somehow, in uh, people's minds, these two identities fuse seamlessly into one. Why is political uh, life so stable in uh, Seten? Because there is no deep division in the village which can be reproduced across time. So the moral fragmentation that everyone is experiencing means that there are no class division, no ethnic, religious or status divisions between people. There are as many moral universes as there are families. All of these overlap with others, but they do not create any sharp boundaries. Moreover, these are never fixed. They are always open to negotiation. Even the closest relatives can become enemies or they can stop being uh, relatives. And strangers may become relatives through marriage, or ritual, and so on. When one looks at an enemy, at a competitor, he doesn't see an essentially different being. He sees a mirror image of his own self motivated by the same kind of interests, speaking the same kind of moral language, of uh, family, of collaborating with the kith and the kin. And he also sees another person for whom the closest relations of kinship, which should be ideally, should be the most moral ones, can turn brothers into enemies and the other way around. There is no way for a Sateni to offer a moral critique of the political system from within the moral order of the village itself. Uh, instead of wrapping up uh, theoretically, I would uh, wrap up with one last ethnographic vignette, which shows how the local politics articulate with the national uh, level. Sometimes politics is the continuation of kinship by other means, to paraphrase Carl Schmidt. I was attending a meeting next to Razan and his faction, meeting in the county uh, seat, where the politicians from uh, Bucharest and quite important national figures came before a round of elections. Each village had sent a little team to the county seat. The first was in a large hall where all the yeah, MPD candidates were presented. And each of them came accompanied by uh, someone or a few people that they had personally helped. So they were not advertised in terms of ideology or in terms of career and so on, but they were advertised for their personal qualities, especially of generosity. Orphans, uh, widows, uh, sick people that uh, they uh, helped. So um, in a way what was presented was their altruism and the way that they're going to be generous towards the people once they get into power. So this was public and the other one was a private affair where all these uh, village uh, groups came to uh, have, uh, let's say, a lunch with, uh, the, with, a big, uh, with the big wigs. But this was in a restaurant next to the city, it's a bit hidden. And when I got there, I was uh, amazed to see the restaurant was arranged exactly as for a wedding as you can see here. So it's, and it's not only the decorations, but it's also the arrangement of uh, tables. So the leaders were sitting at a long table, something like this. You had uh, just like the newlyweds and the parents are sitting and the godparents are sitting. The village groups each had their own tables, just like families have at their weddings. And the main political operators of the region were coming from one family to another one, just like godparents come at a wedding. So godparents come and they shake hands with everyone and they're, they're bringing all the people together. And the keynote speech, which was given by an ex-minister uh, and uh, quite a very uh, reputed and very charismatic individual, almost everything was revolving around the theme of uh, kinship. First of all, he was always addressing everyone as brothers. Then he told them, okay, what will happen if if we lose the elections, think about the fact that uh, your uh, relatives will lose their jobs in um, state authorities that they had received qua relatives. Think about all their families, how, how they will become poor. And said, how can we win the elections? Think of all your relatives, go for months before the elections, visit them at home. Uh, on the day of the election, go with a car, go with a cart. Think of all the people who owe you something, relatives, friends and so on, the kind of relationships that people have. Go and persuade them to win. And then he even explained the national politics, also in terms of kinship, going from the president and from other people, whether they want a certain person to win, which has some kin relationships through his wife with this region, hence he will be more 
positively inclined to this. If the other person wins, then another region, Oltenia, in the south would win because the other candidate has relatives there. All the discussions in the village that I've observed about national politics, in a way they were uh, projecting, in a way that national politics was the politics of Saten at large. So instead of Saten being a microcosm of national politics, the national politics was a macrocosm, was what happening in the village. So this was in terms of how they were representing it and all the kin ties between politicians and so on. And again, it's a long discussion, but I would uh, say that at least to some extent, they were quite realistic and they had an intuitive sense of the national politics of Romania, at least in certain areas where you have exactly this uh, ties of kinship, whether descent or marriage, and a lot of ritual kinship between, uh, between politicians. Can things change? There might be a possibility of change. And this goes into the more cognitive evolutionary perspective in psychology that I'm interested in. In a nutshell, when people live affluent and predictable lives, they become more trustworthy towards um, strangers, towards anonymous people, and they have a long-term perspective upon life. People who grow up in um, poverty, in unstable environments, they have what is called like a short-term perspective upon life. It's more opportunistic, less about trust, it's more about dominance, and so on. Even in Saten, there is a number of people who have lived more affluent lives and they have another moral discourse, which is less about kinship, it's more about humanity at large. This kind of view from nowhere, which is no longer based exclusively on their family, but they think about the common good. And these are usually more entrepreneurial, they were like in liberal professions, they're a bit more educated than others, they have a certain cultural affiliation with Western models. Can these people become a factor of change? It's not impossible, however, there is a moral drain, equivalent of a brain drain, in the sense that it's exactly these kind of people who are more likely to leave the village for various reasons, either for bigger cities or to Western Europe, in order to seek better life conditions for themselves and for their uh, children and so on. And especially because they want to associate with like-minded people and even if there are a few of them in this village or in neighboring village, it's not enough to create like a sense of uh, a group which can somehow propose uh, moral reform or to um, organize as a strong political uh, group which might challenge in a way the corruption and patrimonialism of the village. Even these people with a, with a wider moral universe than the other uh, satanists, even their own behaviors are always contextually adapted with the people that they are engaging with. They seek uh, cooperative partners who are also like them trustworthy, uh, who are in it for the long haul, for this kind of uh, extended uh, cooperation and mutualism across time. But when they are dealing with other people who are, who are known to be opportunistic and short term, they will respond in kind. They, are, they will adapt their strategy to the strategies of the other people. In the words of one of my key informants with a certain reformed moral outlook, even he said that here in Saten, the sheep which cannot carry its wool gets eaten by the wolf. Ultimately and fundamentally, every individual bears the full responsibility for his life because you cannot really trust anyone to a full extent. <laughs> Ce viață?